Get your triple square sockets ready because today we're going to be taking an in-depth look inside the Volkswagen EA888 engine to see what's inside and how it works. Now this 2 liter inline 4 cylinder turbocharged engine has been used across a lot of Volkswagen, Audi and even Porsche models from the late 2000s until today across 3 different generations. Now this particular engine is out of the Mark 6 Volkswagen GTI and as we tear down this engine we're going to take a look at some of the failure points on this engine and what to look out for in case you're looking to buy one. Now starting at the front of the engine here which would be the passenger side on front wheel drive models we got our timing chain cover the top one here being plastic and the lower one here being made of stamped steel now across the side here we've got our oil filter which would screw into here and our oil cooler then next to it we've got our water pump and thermostat assembly as one unit here and then at the top here we have our intake ports where your air intake manifold would bolt up to now across the back of the engine we've got this high pressure fuel pump which is driven off of the exhaust camshaft because this engine is direct injection. The valve cover itself is made of an aluminum alloy as well as the engine head. However the block itself is made of a cast iron whereas the lower oil pan is made of aluminum again and then the actual oil pan at the bottom is made of stamped steel so there's an interesting mix of different materials here. Now that mix of materials as well as the gasket interface could cause one of this engine's major problems and that's oil leaks. You can see here at the engine head to the block interface there's some oil leak happening there. Also where any plastic points join to the metal points like the timing cover here there also could be leaks. Now here at the back of the engine you've got our four exhaust ports now your exhaust manifold and turbocharger assembly would bolt up to it right here and we've also got our oil hookup lines to keep things nice and cool. Now we don't know exactly what was wrong with this engine but I'm going to guess it's some sort of a timing issue. So we're going to go ahead and start by popping off the timing chain cover at the top here. Now taking a look at the timing chain setup we've got our intake camshaft and exhaust camshaft here. And I think I already found an issue here, the timing chain is really loose, so there's probably an issue with the timing chain setup. Now this one being an earlier engine only has variable valve timing on the intake side, later ones give you variable valve timing on the exhaust as well. I've already got a video on how variable valve timing works, so if you want you can click the link above and check that out. Now this one, the solenoid is a bit different, it actually mounts up to here, but instead of the solenoid redirecting oil itself, it's actually going to just push on this little tab here, which is going to redirect oil inside of this gear mechanism here. And this this here is what that little valve looks like. When it presses in, it redirects the fluid flow inside of there. Now in most vehicles, this timing chain guide at the top here just unbolts and so you can retime the engine properly. But on this one here, it's actually part of the valve cover. So you gotta make sure if you do do a valve cover job that this thing seat properly and the gears are timed properly. Watch as I try to rotate this engine over from the crank. It moves this way. And then it just skips timing. Next I'm gonna remove this entire assembly. It's held on by a bunch of T30 Torx. And just loosen all these up. Just try to wiggle this guy off. This guy inside of here is actually a left hand thread. There we go. So with the upper cover removed, I'm then going to remove all the T30s for the lower cover. Now this here is the belt tensioner. I'm going to remove this pulley. The thing is though that tensioner assembly is also part of this oil filter and oil cooler assembly. So we have to remove this entire thing as a unit in order to get access here. Alright, first time using a triple square. And now we should be okay to remove this entire assembly. Now uh, it's got coolant inside. And of course you can see the oil and coolant passages that go through the block in order to feed that assembly. Now I can finally access that hidden bolt. Now I'll pull off the crank pulley. Now they sell you a special tool that has all these teeth here so that you can put this in and properly turn the engine over. Now having this thin stamp steel timing cover means that you pretty much run the risk of bending it as you take it off. And as you can see, I kind of bent it over here in this part. So when you're replacing these, if you're not really careful, it's very likely you're just going to have to get a new one because this is, of course, soaked in oil and it's going to cause an oil leak if you try to reuse it. Now, I've also noticed that there's some damage inside here, here, and here. Looks like the chain or one of the tensioners was grazing against it when it was rattling. Now, if we check out what's underneath the lower timing cover, you can see here we've got the crankshaft. We've got one timing chain that goes down to feed the oil pump. And then we've got another timing chain that goes up the middle here to feed the camshafts. The third timing chain is also driven off by the crankshaft and spins the two balance shafts on the outside here. In fact this engine has three different timing chains each having its own guide and of course tensioner. Now the main tensioner is the one located over here that keeps tension on this chain here for the camshafts up at the top. Now if you take a look at the timing chain problem here you can see I can rotate it clockwise and sometimes it locks up. Now if I rotate it counterclockwise if you pay attention to this tensioner here it can no longer hold tension against this timing chain guide and it just keeps ratcheting back and forth. Now that sound that you're hearing is just it's skipping timing at the bottom here and that's because this ratcheting mechanism inside of here has completely failed. 
And as I can keep rotating it, you can hear it just ratcheting back and forth. And the chain tensioner issue was more for vehicles in the late 2000s and early 2010s. They kind of changed this up for the later models and made it a little bit more reliable. Although if it does fail, it will eventually end up in catastrophic engine damage. Next I'll start removing all of these timing chain guides here. This one here is for the oil pump. You can see its tensioner is just the spring here. And I'll just pop off the chain for the oil pump. Next I'm going to remove the main chain tensioner. And there's the culprit and the reason why this engine's here. Next I'm going to remove the timing chain guides. And slide that guide out. And then since there's no tension here, I can remove the chain. Starting at the top and then out the bottom. Now some EA888 engines also suffered from stretched timing chains which also would have similar effects to that timing tensioner that goes bad in which you lose timing and then you can damage the engine. Now with the other chains out of the way here's a closer look at the balance shaft circuit. Now over here you got your chain guide, your other chain guide and another tensioner over here. So we're going to go ahead and release all of these parts. Now the chain tensioner on this side actually screws directly into the block here but it's got a giant socket which I don't have so I'm just going to go ahead and remove all of these Triple Torx M10s. And that should loosen things up. Remove this guide. Remove this tensioner. Chain guide. Remove this balance shaft gear here. And you can see that the oil pump is actually buried into the sump itself. And this chain dips itself into there. That's how it lubricates this oil pump chain. Next up we're going to take a look at the valve cover on this engine. Now at the top of the valve cover what's missing here is the PCV valve or oil separator and it basically works to ventilate any of the crankcase vapors coming up through here and burn it back through the intake. Now this is a cause for a lot of failures on these engines because they can either clog up or cause a lot of oil burning and they might need to be replaced. Luckily they're just right on top and pretty easy to get to. Now also on top of the valve cover is this high pressure fuel pump. And that's because you've got low pressure fuel coming in from the tank. That's going to pressurize it using the turning from the exhaust camshaft and then send it out to the direct injectors underneath the intake manifold. Looks like T30 is the favorite torques of this engine. So we're going to go ahead and remove all of these bolts holding the high pressure fuel pump on. There we go. And that's what the high pressure fuel pump looks like. Now with the high pressure fuel pump out of the way, we're going to go ahead and remove all these T30 bolts. And with all the bolts removed, I can take off that valve cover. Now the valve cover bolts itself also are part of the top part of these cam bearings here. So once you remove that, the camshaft is actually free to be removed. So we can remove the intake side and the exhaust side. And if you look inside of here, we have a rocker arm system. You can see this one has a hydraulic adjuster on it, which is going to take up any lash. So you don't need to do a valve adjustment. You've got this roller over here, which is what the lobes are going to touch. And that's going to ultimately press down on this valve spring here to open the valve. And things are starting to get pretty oily under this valve cover here. So I'll just use my brother's sock and just wipe up some of the things under this valve cover here so I can see those head bolts. Now, I'm not sure the correct size on these head bolts. But I'm just using a T50, fits kind of loose, but these head bolts don't have any kind of torque to them, so they work. Alright, so we're going to zip off those head bolts. Alright, now we can lift off the head. Uh oh, I see bent valves on all four of these cylinders here. Right now the camshafts are not in there, which means that these valve springs should be pushing down on these valves. But they're pushing down and these valves are still open. If this head could be salvaged, it would definitely need to be remanufactured to redo all these valves. And you could also see on all four of these pistons, there's evidence of valve to piston collision. There's also a lot of carbon buildup. You can see if I use my wife's little toothbrush here, I can scrape a lot of that off. As you already saw, the oil cooler is located right on this side here, so it does share coolant into this water pump assembly to this port over here. Now over on this side here, we have the water pump's belt. If I pull off the water pump here, you can see, and it's driven off of the balance shaft. The balance shaft is inside of the block here, which is driven off of the timing chain on this side of the engine. And over here, there's a small gear that drives this little rubber belt here that feeds the water pump. Now there is no tension on this, which means that when you install it, you just kind of slip it on and then install your water pump. Now these water pumps are another huge sore spot on these Volkswagen engines. This housing here, which is made of plastic, causes them to fail pretty quickly and they also leak. Same thing with the thermostat, which is located in this section over here where your coolant hose hooks up to. Now getting at this water pump is a little bit difficult because it's located underneath the intake manifold, which means that you got a lot of hoses, a lot of wires, a lot of vacuum things to get away, or you got to remove the entire intake itself to, in order to get to this. And once you do, there's also this rubber belt here that you got to deal with, which you probably should replace because in it itself could also fail. I'm going to turn this engine over so we can access it from the bottom. 
Of course, this thing's gonna cause a huge oil leak, so I've got my brother's old t-shirt here to the rescue. I'm gonna sap that up. Now this lower oil pan is made of stamped steel, so we're gonna go ahead and remove all the bolts that go around it. Once again, this does use T30 like the rest of the engine. Just pop off this oil pan here, and we can have a look inside. Now right away we can see we've got a plastic oil baffle here, and you got the oil pump on this side. I can also see the oil pickup tube is nice and clean, there's no sludge in there, and there's a lot of oil everywhere, so we know that this engine wasn't really starved for oil, or was there a sludge issue. Oily situations call for extra measures. I got my wife's old top here, and I'm going to wipe off this oil in this engine here so it doesn't get too messy. I don't think my in-laws are going to be watching this video. I got two more T30s. Now I can lift off this oil baffle. Now with the oil baffle out of the way, you can see that there's an interesting crosshatch pattern that they've casted into here in order to control the oil flow. Next, you got more T30s to remove in order to get the oil pump off. And I'm going to remove this oil pump assembly. It also comes off with that timing chain that drives it. You can see this is the pulley that's going to rotate. And you've got your oil pickup tube over here. And it's going to send it out through this port over here into the engine. Next up there's a bunch of these M10 triple square fasteners all the way around here that hold this aluminum oil pan to the steel block down below. So we're going to go ahead and crack all these free. And I'll just remove this upper oil pan here. And once again another quick wipe down with my wife's old shirt. Now taking a look at the bottom end of this engine here, it's got a typical four cylinder forged crankshaft. Here you've got your reluctor ring here, which is going to pick up signals to this crankshaft position sensor to tell the computer how fast the engine is rotating. Now the fasteners holding the connecting rod caps are e torque so i got to go bust out that socket set. And then these ones here are triple squares for the main bearing. i remove that connecting rod cap. The bearing itself looks fine, so we know that there was no issue with oiling here. This cap's pretty clean, and this one's pretty clean too. Now these pistons have definitely seen better days, they're full of carbon buildup. And of course you can see the impact damage from the valves when the timing went off due to the timing tensioner. Now another common issue on these engines, some versions of them, is that the ring lands would fail, which is the gap between these rings here, because it was too thin. And then you just end up with a chunk of piston that's been broken off and no compression on that cylinder. Now the connecting rods, however, feel pretty beefy and heavy compared to the rest of the piston, especially considering this is only a 2 liter engine. Now the main bearings have triple squares holding them down this way, but they've also got some M10 triple squares holding them across the way this way. So I'm going to go ahead and loosen those up. And the main bearings look fine on this one. Alright, now with all the main bearings out, I can go ahead and lift out this crankshaft here. Now that the engine's completely torn down, we're going to take a close look at some of the components. Starting here at the bottom of the engine where we have this aluminum upper oil pan. We've got this oil pump here, which is going to draw oil from the oil pan area down into this port over here. And if you follow that port on this side, it actually leads up to this hole over here. Now the rest of this doesn't really support the bottom end the way some other engines do, where this bolts up as part of the bearing caps. It really functions more as a baffle or a splash support for the oil that's moving around in here. Next we move to the engine block, which is surprisingly still made of steel. You don't really find this too much with smaller engines because everything's moved towards light weighting. This does have quite a bit of heft to it compared to an aluminum version. Now the oil from the oil pump is going to flow through this hole here, straight down to this area on the front of the engine, which houses the oil cooler and filter assembly. So here we've got this oil cooler and filter assembly. It's actually one big unit that houses this little cooler that looks like a little heat exchanger, which is going to rain cool it from the water pump and circulate it around inside of here to exchange heat with the oil cooler. The oil filter is going to be bolted onto the top here, which makes it pretty easy to access on the top of the engine. Once the oil has been filtered out, it's going to be sent back through these ports here and then back into the block for circulation. Now also to note, the water pump that bolts up to here is going to also send coolant back into the engine through these other two holes over here straight into the coolant jacket. Now while we're at the front part of the engine here, you can see that this cylinder that's sticking out actually houses the balance shaft inside of here and you can see the end of it is what's going to drive your water pump and then of course you've got your water inlet and outlet that connects to the pump and thermostat assembly and as I mentioned before this thermostat and water pump assembly can be quite troublesome so you might want to make sure that when you do change it you upgrade to the metal version now looking down inside the block here you can see the other half of that cylinder where this balance shaft is located you might be able to see as I rotate it inside of there, this is where the balance shaft is. Now also down inside of the block is the main oil galley, which runs from this side all the way over to this side, fed over by that oil filter feed. And it's going to lubricate these main bearings over here. You've also got these little oil sprayers, which are going to spray oil inside of the cylinder walls to help lubricate them. Now coming around to the front back side of the engine here, you can see the other cylinder for the rear balance shaft. That means there's two balance shafts, one over on this side and one over on this side, with this here being the side that the turbocharger bolts up.
And of course on the front side of the engine we've got our timing chain area. We do have a hole here where the timing chain tensioner used to sit and that's because it's a hydraulic tensioner. And of course one of the main flaws of this engine is this timing chain tensioner as I've mentioned before. You can see that it does have a spring tension inside of there. It's also got that port over there where oil can go inside and pressurize it. However the ratchet mechanism which is these grooves here that prevent it from reversing. Now as I push down on this little tooth here it's what's supposed to prevent it from going backwards. However it fails, allow it to go push in. It's actually supposed to be pushing against it and make that ratcheting sound as it releases. So here's an even closer shot. You can see all the teeth on the inside of this tensioner here are completely eaten out. And the little piece here that's supposed to press down against it is also eaten out. So it is definitely a flaw in the design here that allowed that ratcheting mechanism to completely fail. Now taking a look at the head, the valve train itself is pretty straightforward with this roller rocker arm system like any four cylinder engine. One kind of down point is the ignition coils that do plug into the spark plugs kind of tend to fail often. But that's not too hard to replace. Now if we take a look at the front part here, which is where the intake would bolt up to, you can see we've got our intake ports and boy are they black and dirty. Now underneath here we've got the four ports where your fuel injectors are going to plug into and inject fuel directly into the combustion chamber. They don't direct fuel into the ports like a port injected engine and that's because this engine has direct injection. Now, and here's a closer look inside of that intake port. Just how much crust and crud is built up on those valves. It's pretty nasty. And you can see down below here we have those injectors which are going to plug into those ports and they're going to spray fuel through here directly into the combustion chamber. The advantage of this of course is that you get more power and probably better fuel economy. However the big disadvantage as you can see is that you have no gasoline to wash off the back side of these valves here and you end up with so much carbon deposits which could cause issues with idling or the vehicle's function overall. Now let's talk about this catastrophic damage here. And that's these valves. As you can see, they're not properly seated in their home position and there's no camshaft inside. So they should be in the position that you can see the exhaust valves are in. Except because they're all bent, that's why they're bent up like this and pressing against this head face here instead of being down here. And that's because the pistons collided with the valves because the timing was off. And this is an interference engine. I've removed this valve spring from this one. And if I remove the valve itself, you can see just how it's bent. You can also see at the back here just how much carbon is built up and stuck on these valves. That's because this is direct injection only. Now in order to clean this out you probably would have to remove your intake here and either blast walnut material or some kind of abrasion in order to get these intake ports and these valves to be clean. There's actually even more gunk down inside of the intake port itself. You can see when I try to scrub with my wife's little toothbrush here some of it comes off but it really needs to be blasted off or dissolve with some kind of cleaner in order to properly clean these out. Now here on the piston you can see these clean marks here where the carbon is actually chipped off and that's exactly where this intake valve collided with the piston. Now that being said one of the main advantages to this platform is that you can tune it. There's a lot of aftermarket customization tunes available and bolt-on upgrades to make this engine a really good competitor if you want to race it or if you just want a better driving experience on the road. Now this being an iron block it definitely can take a lot more power than an aluminum block and if something catastrophic does happen, chances are you probably still could be able to reuse this block. Now many of the flaws that I've mentioned actually affect only some of the three generations of the EA888 engine and not all of them. So you definitely want to do your research to make sure that those flaws have been corrected if you're purchasing a vehicle with this engine. And I do have a bunch of mechanical reviews if you want to see what the rest of the vehicle looks like around this engine, which you can check out in the Volkswagen GTI, the Volkswagen Tiguan, and the Audi Q5. So you might want to check those links above. Now keep in mind if you are getting an economy class vehicle with this engine in it, such as in a Tiguan or a Jetta, things are going to be a little bit more complicated and you can't expect Corolla-like maintenance because this is a lot more complicated, a little bit more difficult to repair, there's special tools required, and of course being German the parts are more expensive. And that's a wrap on the Volkswagen EA888 engine. Now make sure you follow me on Instagram to find out what the next engine teardown is going to be and subscribe for more videos just like this one.